the son of David, Solomon, took the throne. And his crowning, his coronation, his anointing is described for us in 1 Kings chapters 1 and 2. There, Solomon rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey while the people cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. Ring any bells. Sound familiar? That's why Jesus did it, and that's how the people knew who He was when He came riding into the city of David, Jerusalem, on the back of a donkey. They cried, Hosanna to the Son of David, because they saw a new Solomon, a greater than Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 2, we discover that Solomon didn't rule by himself when he took the throne and was anointed by the high priest of Israel the various royal subjects came before him. They would bow. They would prostrate themselves before the king. They would offer petitions to the king and accept whatever decisions he handed down. But what's so interesting to me, what I recall vividly studying as a Protestant, focusing upon the biblical record of David's kingdom, what really jumped off the page was a passage in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. For there we see Solomon's mother going into the royal court, the royal chamber, where everybody bows before King Solomon, now that he is newly crowned, freshly anointed. When Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Solomon's half-brother Adonijah, the king rose to meet her. And he bowed down to her. And then he sat on his throne and had a throne or a seat brought for the king's mother. And she sat on his right hand. And from that position, at the king's right hand, she gave to him royal petitions. Not just from royal subjects, but from his own brethren who preferred to go through his mother rather than going directly to Solomon himself. On this day, a new institution was established in the kingdom of God there in Israel. Alongside of the Davidic throne, where the son of David sat, was the Gebirah, the queen mother. And we know this because throughout the history of the Davidic kingdom, the office of the queen mother is one of the most prominent features of God's kingdom with the house of David. In fact, if you study 1st and 2nd Kings closely, you will discover one of the most important distinguishing features between the kingdom of Judah with the house of David that was legitimate and the kingdom of Israel up north in Samaria that was illegitimate is that the queen mothers are always identified. 19 out of 21 Davidic kings that are identified are also identified through their queen mothers. Even the term Gebirah in Hebrew, G-E-B-I-R-A-H, comes from the Hebrew Gabar, which means strength. Literally, Gebirah could be translated the strong lady or the great lady. It was known as the queen mother. And as the mother of the successor, she stood as a symbol of royal continuity, dynastic succession. She often worked behind the scenes to ensure that her son would be the next in line. And so it was proper for more than 400 years for there to be at the right hand of the Davidic king, the son of David, who by God's covenant was the adopted son of God. As God had announced to the prophet Nathan back in 2 Samuel 7, I will be his father and he will be my son. The Son of David by nature becomes the Son of God through the grace of adoption. And there at His right hand was enthroned the Queen Mother of the Son of David. For as long as the monarchy lasted, for as long as the Davidic kingdom was on earth, standing as a prototype of what Jesus would fulfill and perfect and establish forever and ever. And so it is. You can find throughout the writings, throughout the historical narratives, as well as the prophets, references to the Queen Mother in the kingdom of Judah. What do we do with this? We recognize it as an essential part 
of the covenant plan of God that David established, that Solomon continued, and that Jesus completed, perfected, and fulfilled with His coming. This is crucial for us to understand what was easy for Matthew to comprehend. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. We'll look briefly at chapters 1 and 2. And there we're going to see a whole lot of royal imagery used. But there is one text that is all important in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. You go back to Isaiah 7.14, and you'll discover that the prophet Isaiah confronted the king, Ahaz, and said, Your faith is sagging. Ask the Lord for a sign. But Ahaz had already decided to disobey. He had already decided to ignore the covenant. He was already secretly bargaining with the enemies of God to enter into strategic alliances. And so Isaiah said, you won't ask the Lord for a sign? Well, He'll give you a sign anyway. If the king, if the man won't cooperate in faith with the Lord, then the Lord will give a sign with the woman, a virgin, the Alma. She shall conceive and bear a son. Scholars who have researched this text in Isaiah 7, verse 14, tracing it back to Hezekiah's birth, tracing it back to Isaiah's day, recognize that the term that is used in the Hebrew, Alma, that notion of virgin, points to the establishment of the Queen Mother. Again, I'm going to quote from Dr. Sri's dissertation. In this oracle, which Isaiah addressed specifically to the Davidic royal household, the young woman bearing forth the royal son, the heir to the throne, would have been understood as the queen mother. That after Ahaz refused to ask for a sign, Isaiah turned away from the unfaithful king and looked to the future by focusing on the heir to the throne and his queen mother. If the man won't cooperate, then God will go to the woman. If King Ahaz won't trust the Lord, then God will raise up the virgin the mother, the queen mother. And that's exactly what Matthew understands the Lord to have done in Mary to fulfill the Isianic oracle. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. And so God was with us like never before. This is what we need to understand. The queen mother, when Solomon bowed before his mother, this was not simple courtesy. This was royal protocol. The Queen Mother was more than a title. It was a royal office. Not only in Solomon's day, but in Jesus' time as well. When he began his public ministry at the behest of his mother, revealing his glory at the marriage supper at Cana, and then he began to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, he was there intent upon restoring the specific kingdom of David that God had covenanted himself to 1000 BC. You cannot understand Jesus' ministry. You can't understand Christ's mission apart from the Davidic covenant. But once you see the Davidic covenant as the background for the gospel presentation of Jesus, you're going to be ready to understand the role and the office of Mary and why it is that Mary, who fulfills her role as a royal counselor, as a queen mother, is eventually exalted when her son, the royal son of David, ascends into the heavenly Jerusalem. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 11. In Revelation chapter 11, we hear the seventh angel blowing his trumpet and then a voice in heaven crying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, His Messiah. And He shall reign forever and ever, just as God had sworn. He will reign forever through the Son of David. And this is the kingdom that the angel announces that Christ has established in His death and resurrection, in His ascension, in His royal enthronement in the heavenly Jerusalem. And as we continue on in John's prophecy, 
We read in Revelation 12, just a couple of verses later, a great sign appeared in heaven. It's the same Greek word that you'll find in Isaiah 7, 14. The Lord will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive. And so a sign appears in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. What is the significance of the crown? This makes the woman a queen. What is the significance of the crown being twelve stars? She is the queen of heaven. Her royal authority is a cosmic queenship, just like her son's is a cosmic kingship. And it goes on to describe the boy that she bore, the child, in verse 5. She brought forth a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That is a quotation taken straight from Psalm 2, verse 9, a famous psalm written about the Davidic king, the Davidic kingdom. And this describes for us who the little boy is that the woman bore. This is why from the earliest times, the Blessed Virgin Mary was recognized by believers in the East and the West as the Queen Mother of the Son of David. It wasn't a point of debate. It wasn't an issue of controversy. It was a topic of prayer. It was a subject of the hymns of the early church. This is our legacy. This is our lady. This is our mother. This is our queen. This is an integral and indispensable part of the kingdom of Jesus. You cannot have Jesus as king if you won't have Mary as queen. This is the gospel of the new covenant. This is what we find when we read the whole Bible, not just in proof texts, but in typology. In the 20th century, Pope St. Pius X looked at Revelation 12 and asked the question, Who is this woman? And he replied, Everyone knows this woman, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars. Everyone knows that this woman signifies the Virgin Mary. John saw the most holy mother of God in eternal happiness, travailing in a mysterious childbirth. What birth was it? Surely it was the birth of us who are still in exile, who are yet to be generated to the perfect charity of God and to eternal happiness. You see, she is laboring, not in birthing Jesus, but in birthing us. In Revelation 12, verse 17, we discover that she has other offspring besides the Messiah, those who keep the commandments of God. As we strive to keep the commandments, as we strive to fulfill the covenant, we experience our weakness, but we experience God's strength. And how, where, who? The Blessed Virgin Mary, the New Eve, the Ark of the New Covenant, the Queen Mother of the Son of David. She is the one we turn to. Not just because the Bible says so, not just because the church teaches it, because we need her. And it's high time we acknowledge it. I remember very clearly something that happened to me 15 years ago, within a year of having become Catholic. I returned to the seminary that I had graduated from, summa cum laude, at the time, a very staunch anti-Catholic evangelical Protestant who went on to ministry for a short period before the Lord picked me off with a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of truth that led me into the Catholic Church in 1986. Shortly thereafter, I went back to my seminary to visit. And I spent a weekend with a former professor who had become a dear friend whom I had served as a teaching assistant. He and his wife were very close to Kimberly and to me. I was alone with them. Kimberly couldn't come along, and she wasn't Catholic yet anyway. So one night we sat down, and we began an intense discussion that ended up lasting for hours. It was a discussion that I had prayed for and prepared for, for days, for weeks, for months. And in the beginning it felt like batting practice. He raised all of the questions and the objections that I had raised against Catholicism and then found answers to. The Pope, purgatory, the saints, the Eucharist. He was raising all of my familiar objections and I was going to 
one part of the Bible, then another and another. And his wife was looking more and more surprised at how easily it was to find answers to all of these common objections to Catholicism. And then finally, as evening drew nigh, we turned to the Blessed Virgin. And we dealt with the Immaculate Conception. We dealt with the perpetual virginity. We dealt with several other issues. And I kept trying to make the point that the more we make of Mary, the more we make of Christ's redemptive work. Because He is the one who made her everything I believe her to be. Everything the church teaches her to be. So I kept underscoring this idea that Mary is the masterpiece of Christ. As hours went by, I was feeling flush with success and a wee bit of spiritual pride, I suspect. And as midnight drew closer, I was feeling a little weary. He was still going, though. And I could tell with this last topic that he raised, he was really ready to pounce. He said, what about the Assumption of Mary? And I said, what about it? He said, where do you find it in the first 500 years? And I'm like, oh boy, do we have to go back, you know? And so I went to Revelation 12. He said, no, we're not going to deal with that. I want testimony in the first 500 years. And I said, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of any. And he said, what? Can you recommend any books? And I was really feeling tired and my mind was scrambled. My memory wasn't working. And I said, no, Dr. So-and-so, I really can't. I can't think of any where he said, what? And I felt ashamed. I felt scatterbrained. I felt humiliated, and I said, no, I really can't. Now it was his turn. He said, well, you know, this is an infallible dogma. You've got to believe it on pain of mortal sin. And you can't give me any sources from the first 500 years. You can't even recommend articles or books. Well, I think it's time to go to bed. <laughs> and he and his wife went ahead and got ready for bed while I picked myself up from the sofa and marched up to the attic feeling ashamed of myself. That last pitch, I swung and I missed, and I felt like I'd struck out. I was really tired. I got down on my knees before going to sleep. I prayed one Hail Mary and offered a sincere apology to Our Lady. And I realized that it really isn't up to me. I rolled over and went to sleep. In their hospitality, they let me sleep in. And so around 9.05 a.m., they woke me up. And I smelled the bacon and eggs breakfast. I came down and I was enjoying breakfast when suddenly I, I spotted the calendar on the wall. And I realized what the date was, December 8th. Now, I was a new convert. And so what is very familiar to you cradle Catholics was still a new thing for me. Something rang a bell. December 8th, there's something about this date. And then I remembered, it's a holy day of obligation. It's the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And so I, I realized, I've got to get to Mass, and yet I've got to fly home. How am I going to squeeze both into this day? So I mentioned it to my host. I, I said to Robin, you know, is there any way I could get to Mass today? And she said, you're in luck. St. Paul's is right in our backyard. What time is there Mass? She said, how would I know? <laughs> so very sensitively, she called them up, and then she heard the secretary say, Mass is just getting over. No other Mass is scheduled for the day. She proceeded to call a half a dozen other parishes in the area in her kindness to me. And every single parish, the same thing was true. The Mass was over. What a schmuck I felt like. Not only did I botch it the night before, but now I'm going to forget about a holy day of obligation, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. She was looking down at the yellow pages and she said, Well, here's something I never saw before. There's a Carmelite chapel about 15 miles from here, down in Peabody. Could you make it to that? I said, well, you know, if there's a Mass. And so she called. And sure enough, right at noon, a Mass was scheduled. And so I spent the morning visiting former professors. I got in the car, and I skedaddled down to Peabody, about 15 miles away. I didn't know where the chapel was. It turned out it was in the basement of a shopping center. I could tell by all the Christmas shoppers who were going down in haste at 11.59 with me. And then this old priest sauntered out of the sacristy, a bell rang, and the Mass began. And I looked at the man and how slowly he moved, and I thought, this could really make it tight to get to the airport in time, you know. He looked to be in his 70s. He was moving and speaking very slowly. And I was wondering, oh no, it's going to be another one of those homilies. You know how it is. For converts, it isn't always easy. But this time it was very different. 
After the scripture readings, when he got up to the pulpit, he preached a homily like I had never heard before. With twinkling eyes, he looked out at this packed basement chapel audience and he said, today we celebrate our mother. And we celebrate the work of her son, our Savior. The fact that he conceived her without original sin. And there are people around us throughout this city who want to know why we believe it. And I want to tell you what you ought to tell them. That if you could have created your mother, how would you have done it? If you could have spared your mother the corruption and the taint of original sin, would you have done it? Of course you would have. But you couldn't, and so you didn't. But Jesus could, and so Jesus did. And we celebrate the Jesus of Scripture and the work of Christ and Mary. And he went on and on like this for 15 minutes. And I'm thinking, this is like Father Billy Graham. I couldn't believe my luck, the blessing of hearing this guy go on and on. Fifteen minutes later, it felt like two minutes. And then he proceeded on with the rest of the Mass. And it just flew by. I was exuberant with joy and gratitude. And when it was over and he pronounced the benediction, in about 21 seconds, all the Christmas shoppers were gone. I was alone praying. And I saw him moving in the sacristy. A thought occurred to me. I remembered I couldn't think of any sources last night for my professor friend. And so, cautiously, I worked my way up to the sacristy. I knocked on the door and I said, Father, do you have a minute? And he said, no, not really. And I said, well, do you have a second? He said, what do you want? And I said, well, you were so good on the Immaculate Conception. I'm wondering if you could answer a question about the bodily assumption. He said, who are you? And I told him my name, and I said, I graduated from Gordon-Conwell Seminary. So I was a staunch evangelical, anti-Catholic, but just this past year, I became a Catholic. And he said, you know, I used to teach there. I used to be there. I'm like, no, you don't understand. It's an evangelical Protestant seminary. He said, no, young man, you don't understand. It used to be a Carmelite seminary until we sold it to you. And he's eyeing me up and down, and he said, oh, so we give them the seminary, and they give us the graduates. That's a pretty good deal. I like that, you know. Very funny, Father. I like that, too. And I said, well, last night I was really stumped by my professor on the bodily assumption. He asked me for a title, and I couldn't think of any. You were so good on the Immaculate Conception, I was wondering if maybe you could recommend something on the bodily assumption. And he said, well, no wonder you couldn't come up with anything because there's only one book in English. And it just went out of print last week. And I said, wow, Father, you really know your bibliography. He said, I should. I wrote it. <laughs> Suddenly, I felt like I was entering a twilight zone of sorts, you know. I'm like, you're kidding. He said, no, I'm not. I wrote it. I've got two copies. The publisher told me I ought to hold on to them, but I don't think I'm going to. What's your name again? What's your wife's name? And he inscribed it to us. And then he said, what's the professor and his wife's name? And he inscribed a copy to them. And I was still trying to recover from my holy shock. And as I left, I drove back to their home, just barely with enough time to tell him what happened. He was in the driveway as I was putting my suitcase into his trunk. And I said, Dr. So-and-so, here's a copy of a book. You were asking about the bodily assumption. There's only one book in print. It just went out of print. And the author happened to be the one who said Mass in that Peabody Chapel. And I watched as his jaw dropped to the ground. <laughs> and I was so grateful that he had a copy to read. And I took it home and I read it too. But I learned a much more important lesson that day than simply how you could find sources in the first five centuries for the bodily assumption and how you could substantiate from Scripture, including Revelation 12, the bodily assumption, I learned the lesson that ultimately it isn't up to our argumentation. It isn't up to my intellectual prowess. It's up to the Holy Spirit. We're not out to win arguments. We're out to win souls. Souls of our brothers and sisters who are sons and daughters of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we need to be humbled sometime to learn that again. Just a few months ago, as I was sending off the manuscript of Hail Holy Queen to Doubleday, I wondered what I was going to do for a foreword. I had asked a friend of mine to write a foreword. Instead, he wrote a brief endorsement. He misunderstood my request. 
And so in prayer, I asked the Lord one morning, who can I ask? Who do you want to write the foreword to Hail Holy Queen? And I didn't hear a voice, but suddenly I had this thought. I wonder if old Father Killian Healy, the Carmelite, is still alive. No, he'd be in his 90s. But on an impulse, I dialed Boston area directory information. And I said, is there a number for a Carmelite chapel up in the Peabody Mall? And she said, sure. She gave it to me. I hung up. I said a prayer. It was a Hail Mary. <laughs> I called the number. I hear a man's voice on the other side. I said, uh, may I speak to a Father Killian Healy? He said, Yar. I said, Father Killian Healy, you don't remember me, but my name is Scott, and of course I remember you. I've had a lot of people come by the chapel to see it and to meet me and to ask me when the book is coming into print. I still don't know. I said, I don't either. I said, but would you be willing to, to write a foreword to a book I have written where I tell the story about our chance encounter at the conclusion of the book? He said, I'd be thrilled to. When do you need it? I said, in about 72 hours. But I could give you a week. He said, if you send it Federal Express, I sure will. And he sure did. It was there in 24 hours. He read it in two days. He called me. He thanked me. And he sent me a forward that I thank God for. So, inhale, Holy Queen. The ending is the story of this so-called chance encounter. The forward is written by this awesome priest, Father Killian Healy. And in between the foreword and the conclusion, I summarize and simplify his scholarly study of the Assumption of Mary and the Immaculate Conception and other topics as well. Because it is our birthright, brothers and sisters. She is our mother. She is our queen. She is more than the new Eve. She is more than the Ark of the New Covenant. She is my mama and yours. And I am not ashamed to admit it. This came home to me even more recently. Just a couple of, well, just a few months ago, I was in Rome with Kimberly and the kids on a pilgrimage to Rome and Assisi. In fact, this brand new tape series called The Venerable Bead, the Bible study on the rosary that Kimberly and I did was in the making. We were there in Assisi and then we were planning to go to Rome for a week to give these talks, these meditations on the rosary. We arrived on Saturday. Sunday, we began our pilgrimage tour of Assisi. Just three weeks earlier, my six-year-old son Joseph had undergone an emergency appendectomy. We didn't think he'd be able to come. The surgery was so successful, both doctors gave us the green light. He's fine. He can go along. And he had no pain when we were packing, when we were traveling. But that Saturday night when we arrived, he was squirming a little bit right where the surgery had been. i got to tell you, it's hard for me. I am no good at pain, especially when my kids are experiencing it. Just three weeks earlier, a class of mine had been interrupted with a phone call from the hospital where Kimberly said, Joseph's appendix is about to burst. You've got to drop everything and get in here. And it was scary. And on the way to the hospital, I couldn't think straight, and I certainly wasn't driving legally. When I got there, I didn't know where to go. I'm begging God. I'm asking Mary. The first person I bump into is a priest. He said, I'm going up to the floor where the pediatric surgery is done. We get in the elevator. I said, my six-year-old's about to undergo an emergency appendectomy. He said, it's all right. I'm like, thanks. He said, no, it's all right. When I was six, I underwent an emergency appendectomy more than 70 years ago. And when I got up there, he blessed my son and the surgery was so successful. But three weeks later, it was another story, because when we woke up Sunday morning and began our week-long adventure, our pilgrimage, Joseph was in agony, and he's tough. He doesn't give in to pain easily, but he couldn't stand up straight. He couldn't even walk. We had to take our baby out of the stroller and put our six-year-old in as we strolled a CC until finally he couldn't even do that anymore, so I took him back to the hotel. He was crying in agony. We put a call out. An CC physician came by who knew just a little bit of English. He looked at him, took his temperature, did a few tests, and said, we got to get him to the Assisi hospital right away, the emergency room. So, in paternal panic, 
I picked up my son, got into a cab, and went to the tiny little hospital in Assisi, Italy, where nobody speaks English.